Well, happy Mother's Day. That choir gets hit and appreciate all of them. Without moms, I wouldn't be here. So, neither would you. So praise God for moms. And I'll be reading now to 1 Samuel. And if you're able, if you remain standing. And uh, if you're unable, stand up on the inside. That's what God sees anyway. But the uh, book of 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. And the word says, But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. And then Elkanah, her husband, uh, said, said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not, uh, not better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. You may be seated. Oh, praise the Lord. Well, uh, welcome again to Spokane Baptist Church. I'm glad that you're here. And uh, I, I prayed about what to preach on today. We've been doing our series on, um, <clears throat> I pray about it every Sunday. <laughs> Amen. But uh, I spent some extra time just talking to the Lord about, okay, God, what do you want to do? It's Mother's Day. And um, I was looking at the questions that Jesus asked. And we're getting back to that next Sunday. I, I got another good one I've already started working on. Um, but the Lord just, uh, just convicted my heart. I, I just felt burdened to pull aside specifically and talk about moms and specifically some lessons we can learn from moms. And the message went a little bit of a different direction than I expected. It's a little bit heavier, especially up front, uh, kind of than I originally anticipated it was going to be. Um, we'll get there. I want to say... Uh, a couple of things uh, here as we get started. So we're going to talk about Hannah, one of the most famous mothers in the Bible, and some lessons that we can learn uh, from the life of Hannah. And there's some rich and deep truths here. There's some, there's some hard things and some very encouraging things. But before we get into that even, I'd like to say, and we'll read and pray in just a moment, but I'd like to say it is important to honor your mother. Ephesians 6, 2 and 3, it's uh, in your bulletin, it's in your outline if you uh, want to see it there. But the Bible says, honor thy father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with thee that thou mayest live long on the earth. Now, honor your father and mother made it into the Ten Commandments, God's top ten list. And it's repeated for us here in the New Testament that we need to honor our father and mother. And in the New Testament, it highlights for us that uh, if this was the first commandment that God gave that came attached with a promise. It said, honor your father and mother. And by the way, if you do that, it's going to matter in how your life goes. And um, honor is different than obey. Somebody say amen. And honoring is a tricky subject. And I've counseled many people on, especially in deeply broken relationships with mothers or fathers, what does it look like to honor them in the midst of, a, of some deep brokenness? But even, even in those cases, it is important to honor. And so whether your mom is still alive today or whether she's uh, gone on before, I want to encourage you today is a day that the Bible, the Bible doesn't give us a specific day to do it. It just says that we should. But today's a good day to honor your mom. A couple thoughts about that is just a, some counsel I give people personally. I'll, give, I'll just tell you all here. Part of it is, first of all, if you have a godly mother, not everybody does. So give thanks if you're one of those that has a godly mother. You, you should give thanks if your mom's still with us, call her. Tell her you appreciate her today. It's important to do that. Some of you have adopted mothers. They're not biologically your mom, but the women who stepped in and filled that role, who gave you godly instruction and reproof, honor them and pray for them. For those of you here this morning who are lacking a godly mother, 
Maybe for whatever reason, your mom was not the kind of person that walked with the Lord, was not maybe there when you needed her to be. Uh, I have, or maybe she's just, maybe you had a godly mom, but she's in heaven now. And, but if for whatever reason that spot is empty right now for you, I want to, I have some advice for you. Adopt a godly mother. Amen. A number of you at Spokane Baptist Church have done this. <laughs> and I, I love it. People have their church moms uh, here. And I love it when I overhear that. And I'll tell you this. If you'll really do it, if you'll really adopt one as, as a mom and honor her and get her counsel and listen to her when you're going through stuff, if, you'll, if it's not just a lip service thing, if you'll really adopt a godly mother, that'll be a great blessing to you. Identify a godly woman with a life like you want. Somebody that's got the kind of marriage you'd like to have, that's got the kind of relationship with her kids that you'd like to have, and say, would you be my mother? <laughs> And I'd like to say this also. We can all learn from the godly mothers of the Bible. The Bible is filled with rich examples like this. Some of you totally lacked a woman like this in your life. And if that's you, I'd say you ought to thank God for the Bible. There's many reasons, but one of them is that the Bible is filled with examples of mothers that we find in here. And we're going to do that this morning. We're going to take the rest of the service to learn some lessons from Mama Hannah and to get some lessons from her. I have this short video. It's just uh, two, two minutes and 30 seconds long about some of the mothers in the Bible. Uh, and you've got some cross-references in your, in your bulletin there. But, but we'll dim the lights here. Watch, watch this here. Motherhood plays an important role in the Bible. It binds the beginning and the end. These stories offer us a glimpse into the heart of God. And so we start at the beginning. Taken from the side of Adam, gifted with bringing forth life, the first woman was named Eve because she was the mother of all living. But she was also a mother in her own right, the first of many mothers to come. Though Sarah's womb was closed, God promised nations and kings would come from her. Ten years pass and motherhood seems as impossible as the day it was promised. But the Lord is faithful to keep his promises, and Sarah bore a son who made her laugh. Leah was the firstborn, overlooked by her husband Jacob, who gave his heart to her younger sister. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. Despite Jacob's disdain, she found her motherhood in the Lord. When Pharaoh became angry at the fruitfulness of the Hebrews, Jochebed sacrificed her motherhood for the sake of her son. When Pharaoh's daughter saw the child, she had compassion on him. Because of Jochebed's sacrificial motherhood, the Israelites found freedom. Naomi was a mother who experienced the loss of her sons. Yet she gained a daughter in Ruth who declared, For where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Naomi and Ruth became family by faith. Mary, a virgin and not yet married, was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. The motherhood of this blessed woman was more than the continuation of a family name, but a means for God to bring a savior into the world to save his people from their sins. From the garden to the cross, there have always been mothers. These women paved the way for all women, representing the full spectrum of the ways one could be called mom. Whether a mother in faith, mentorship, adoption, or by birth, you play an important role in the stories of generations to come. To all the Sarahs, Leahs, Jochebeds and Naomi's. Happy Mother's Day. Well, thank God for the Bible and the examples we have in it. Amen. So as you, uh, Mother's Day touches on so many different things. It's impossible to cover it all. And we're going to just deal with a couple of things this morning. But I wanted to give you some of the cross-references. They're there in your outline 
If the Lord spoke, for, for some of you moms or longing to be moms or whatever you, wherever you find yourself today or missing a mom, uh, I wanted you to have those cross-references in your outline uh, for uh, stories that you might go read for some encouragement, some wisdom, some insight into that. I added one that's not in the video, and that's Lois. Um, and she's the faithful grandmother who, even though her immediate kids, um, or her, her son, anyway, it, her faith is the one that gets credited for residing into Timothy, who then becomes Paul's right-hand guy. It's a very cool story and encouraging to grandmothers also. So today we're going to talk about mothers. We're going to talk about a mother specifically, but I want to give one final word of encouragement to those mothers who are here today who are still actively in the process of raising your kids. And we have a bunch of moms who are right now in the thick of it, right in the oven. Uh, and if that's you, I would like to give you a word of encouragement from something that one of the great preachers ever, Charles Spurgeon, said. He said this. He said, you are as much serving God in looking after your own children and training them up in God's fear and minding the house and making your household a church for God as you would be if you had been called to lead an army to battle for the Lord of hosts. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. So mother, I know that motherhood is one of those things that often goes underappreciated. Somebody say amen. amen. So moms, especially those of you that are still in the middle of raising kids, you're doing as much of God's work as if you were leading an army to battle. And so good job, mom. Keep it up. Be encouraged. We're praying for you, and we got your back. Okay. So now to our text. We're going to talk about Hannah, 1 Samuel uh, 1. If you've got your Bibles open there, um, we're going to move through this uh, relatively quickly. I, I designed this to be a little bit of a shorter message on purpose. Um, and so I'm going to try to move quickly through this, which is not the same thing as quick. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm not going to shortchange you on the preaching. All right. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, and look at verse 1. Do you want to watch your pastor earn the, find out why they pay me the big money? Watch this here, verse 1. Now, there was a certain man of Raphama Izophim, of the Mount of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroaham, the son of Elhu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. Yeah! <laughs> Double that guy's pay is what you're thinking. <laughs> All right, verse 2. So here, so we meet Elkanah. And in verse 2, it said that he had two wives. May I say to you quickly, that's one too many. <laughs> We're coming back to that. He had two wives. The name of one of them was Hannah. And the other nun was named Paniah. And Paniah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man, he went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were the priests of the Lord there. So this time Eli is the chief priest and he has his two sons who are carrying a lot of the workload. Verse 4. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Paniah his wife and all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah, he gave a worthy portion. He gave a, a bigger gift to Hannah, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. She is infertile. All right, let's pray and then we'll get into it. God, we thank you for this portion of scripture and for this testimony, this word, this record that we have of the life of Hannah. Lord, Mother's Day, it's a, it's a big room. There's lots of things. God, would you please do what only you can do? Lord, I have things prepared, but the task is overwhelming. I am very daunted in the face of what needs to be done. But I can't do it anyway. And I need those reminders sometimes. These are your people. They've come to hear from you. Lord, as we look into your word, we pray that you might speak clearly to every heart. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The first point, if you want to follow along in your bulletin and fill some blanks in here this morning, I'd invite you to, to do that. And we've got some of the cross-references we'll look at or 
Of course, you're welcome to just listen. The first thing I'd like to comment about this morning out of the text is the real-life brokenness and the real-life loss that's in this story. Right away, just in these first five verses, we see quite a bit of hurt or quite a bit of brokenness. It's interesting to me that the Bible, like here's, here's Elkanah and, and Hannah who are set out for us really as examples of people who are trying to follow God and trying to do the right thing. And we rightly think about Hannah as one of the heroes uh, of our faith. And, and yet we find that they're uh, in this marriage with multiple wives and the there's barrenness in this relationship. And as we'll see, there's infighting and disputing. Because again, how could there not be? You violate God's order and you're going to find problems. I'd like to say this just quickly. The Bible gives us a true and honest look at the lives of real people. I mean, it's an interesting thing that, I mean, here we have as somebody that the Bible is going to hold out for us as a role model, but tells us about some of the ugliness and brokenness in their life. And sometimes that surprises people that when they read the Bible, they're expecting for the heroes of our faith that we're going to get this sanitized picture where they're just godly people who do and say the right things and never make big mistakes. But those people have never read the Bible. Because even for our heroes, we see how terribly they can mess up. And how badly they can get turned upside down. It makes me kind of glad that I'm not in the Bible. <laughs> I feel bad sometimes for these people that some of these uglier parts of their life are written down in the eternal word of God. And you think, whoa, <gasps> I just as soon not have everybody know that much about me. Even though these people are followers of God, they're not perfect. Because of course they're not. The Bible loudly and repeatedly condemns polygamy, but it records it, even when God's people get involved in this sin. Why? It's not trying to embarrass these people. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them, to these Old Testament people, for in samples, that's not a typo, in sample is stronger than example, it means a template. It's a pattern. We get to look at the real lives of real people, messiness and all, and it's a much more powerful example than just some sanitized version where we only hear about the good parts. When you see the good and the messy all put there together, they become real people, which they were, and as we get the real look and the honest look at their story, it's a much more powerful testimony to us today because our lives are messy and we don't always do the right things. But that doesn't mean that God can't use you. That doesn't mean that you're not sincere in following after the Lord. Sometimes God's people can get turned very upside down. But good news, God uses those people. And God will use you. The second thing I want to say about this is it's hard to understand why God allows so much hurt. I got stuck you're going to start to panic maybe in a minute when you realize how long we're spending on just these first five verses of Hannah's story. Um, but that's intentional. We're going to move more quickly through the other verses. We're going to intentionally spend probably about half of our time just in these first five verses. And, and the reason for that is, is as I was preparing it, I, I got hung up just myself even on the end of verse five. Where it says that Hannah... Elkanah, her husband, gave to her a worthy portion. He, he gave her a bigger gift, for he loved her. And, and in the Hebrew here, the loved, he loved her more than his other wife. And so that's not great either, is it? So he loves Hannah the most, and he's showing it. There's out, overt favoritism. He gives her a, a nicer gift than he gave his other wife. And it says, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And there's just, there's so much like hurt wrapped up in just one verse. People messing up and playing favorites. And we can take a moment to feel bad for Paniah. You're going to lose your sympathy for her in just a moment. 
But before we do that, let's feel a little bit of sympathy for this poor woman who's in a marriage where she is clearly not the favorite wife. And then Hannah, who desperately wants to be a mother, lives in a culture where much of her worth is tied up in that, and she's barren. It's a strike at the heart of what she believes it means to even be a woman. And it says that the Lord did it. And I, I struggled through this. You know, I, I'm the father of a special needs kid and, 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 and I, as, just, as a pastor, encounter so many people that are dealing with so many deep wells of, of hurt. And, and some of those things are, uh, there's a number of women in our church right now that are carrying the burden of infertility and, and, and who have had to bury their kids and... And people who have desperately sick kids. And, and I just, at home and, and at church, I, I'm constantly running into these deep wells of hurt. And, you know, it's hard to understand why God would allow this. Now, we could get into some theology this morning about what does God do and what does God allow. I will say this to you. The Bible is emphatically clear that God always does what's right and God always does what's good. 1 John 1, 5 is in your outline. This then is the message that we have of him and we declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The Bible could not be clearer about this. Not that verse, but page after page. So what do we make of all this hurt? Why would God allow it? Or why would God even send difficulty? By the way, sometimes God does in fact send what we would describe as suffering, whether it's the plagues on Egypt or whether sending his son to die on an old rugged cross. And at the end of the day, I'll tell you this. We're not going to get into the theology of parsing this apart. If you want to do that sometime, I'm glad to do that with you. But I'd like to say that when you're hurting, when you're facing hurt, whether God sent it or just allow it doesn't really matter. Because either way, we say God could stop this and has not stopped it. So what do we make of this? Classically, this is referred to as the problem of evil. It's one of the chief complaints against the Christian religion. It is the reason that many young people will grow up in church and leave it when they become adults. If you get into a debate with an atheist or an agnostic, if it's not the first thing, it will be very early on and the arguments that they will make against the Christian God is what we call the problem of evil. And it goes like this. If God is good, and if God is powerful, then why is there so much evil? Is God willing to stop evil but unable? Is God able to stop evil but unwilling? Now, I want to say to you, the Bible has answers for this. It's important that we talk about it from time to time. This will not be a thorough, all the way deep dive on the subject. It's a very big one. And I've already said it's hard to understand. But I want to say that, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to explain it a little bit this morning. I'm going to tell you what the Bible has to say about it. I'm going to try to explain it in two ways. But I, before we do that, I have one other thing I want to say. And that's that I don't believe this is the problem of evil is fundamentally a problem of intellectual understanding. Because the Bible is going to explain it to us in a, in a way that speaks to our minds and in a way that speaks to our emotions. But even after you comprehend the answer, you're probably not going to feel a lot better about it. Because we don't want it to be true. Because we don't want to hurt, 
because we don't want the people that we love to hurt. And that's okay that you don't want that. Good news, you're not a sociopath. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Some bright morning, we're going to understand this better. For now, I'd like to try to help. The answer to why God allows so much hurt can be summed up a few ways, but I like this one, and it goes like this. God's goals are better than just to avoid suffering. We have this idea that life would be great if we could just avoid suffering. If we didn't have to hurt, if we didn't have to grieve, if we didn't have to bury our loved ones, if we didn't have to watch them cry, if we didn't have to endure grief and loss, then things would be great. But that is not true. And God knows it. And God wants something better for your life than just a life where you didn't hurt too much. That's not always real comforting at a graveside. But it's true. You say, Pastor, what possibly could be better than avoiding suffering? I'm going to tell you three things. God's better goals are, first of all, that God would like us to seek for eternal life. As we try to avoid hurt and grief and loss and suffering and death and dying, we are fundamentally involved in the extension of this life. But that's not the best thing. Life is a gift and it is a blessing, but it's not the best one. There's a better life than this. There's a better world than this one. Amen. And the more invested we are here, the less we'll care about the next one. If you read from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve rebel against God, they choose themselves over God. The very next thing God does is he puts them out of the Garden of Eden for the express purpose of making sure they do not live forever. You go read it. God says, I must drive them out of the garden lest they take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. And God says, we must prevent that from happening. Because if Adam and Eve could have stayed in the garden and lived forever, we think, well, what would be wrong with that? I'll tell you what would be wrong with that. They would live forever apart from God. Amen. Their relationship with God is broken, and God does not want them to continue in that state forever. What would be so bad with that? If I could have everything I wanted, and if I could have my own way, and I could be in charge, and I could still live forever, and I could still live in the garden, we, even without God, that doesn't sound so bad. You may not know this, but you've just invented the devil. How did Satan become what he is? He said, I can be like God. I can be my own God. I can have my own way. And I will do it all without suffering. I will cut myself off from God and I will be just fine. I would rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. And it's not a good trade. There's something in humanity that has some sympathy for the devil. He almost can come across when you look at it as an almost heroic figure who said, I'd rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. And there's something in the human spirit that responds to that. And that's an ugly, broken part of us. We want to be gods ourselves without the consequences of what that means. And so God is allowing us to experience some of the consequences of what it would mean if people were God. All this selfishness, all this me, myself, and I, and my way, 
Look at what it's done. This is as close to hell as I ever want to get. Amen. And God lets us experience this so that we can make a better choice. God doesn't want you to just seek to live forever here. He wants you to have eternal life. Acts 17, I'm not just making this up. I want you to see what the Bible says. But there's much the Bible says about this, but quickly this morning. The Bible says that God that made the world and all things therein hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. By the way, that's a fascinating scientific truth. God made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. He hath determined the times before appointed, the bounds of their habitation. God put limits on our life. Why? Why would he hem us in? What's the Bible say? That they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. God's not far away. But without the hurt and the grief and the loss of this world, we would be probably prone to think, this is fine. This. And we would go on living without him. In my own life, I've seen how quick I am to rely on myself when things seem to be going fine. But even when things are going fine, they are not going the way that God has designed us to go. God has something better than your life being fine. He has something better than that. Secondly, God wants us to develop something that's more valuable than not suffering. He wants us to develop faith. We are very prone to discount the value and the importance of faith compared to avoiding suffering. We would say, if I could just not hurt, if I could just be well, if this person just hadn't died, if that relationship just weren't broken, that would be the most valuable thing. But that's not the most valuable thing. I'm not saying those things aren't valuable. I'm saying they're not the most valuable thing. And we tend to think, well, the, the strength or the value of our faith is somehow it, intangible. But that's not how God looks at it. In 1 Peter 1, 6, it says, wherein now you greatly rejoice, even though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, that it might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, hey, gold's valuable. That's why we run it through the fire, to purify it. But you, you're way more valuable than gold. Your faith is worth way more than any pile of gold could ever be. And if we'll run gold through the fire to purify it, let's not be sad when we get run through the fire. Let's rejoice that God is purifying something of infinite value in us. That's not my first reaction to going through the fire. <laughs> but may I say to you, I look back on the periods of my life when I've been most intensely in the furnace. And those are the periods when I have most become more like Christ. I wish I did not have to suffer I wish my daughter didn't have to suffer. But those are the times when God has made me more compassionate. Those are the times when God has made me more humble. Those are the times when God has made me kinder. When things are going well and I'm not suffering, that does not make me a kinder, humbler, more compassionate person. And I want to be those things. Those things are valuable in a way that I can, in a sense, rejoice at the things that God used to produce that in my life. God is thirdly guiding us away from the temporary and towards eternal glory. It's hard to let go of these things, but God is trying to take them so that they can be replaced with something of eternal glory. 
You cannot fill a cup that is already full. If God's going to put some new things into our lives, it stands to reason some things are going to have to come out first. Romans 8, the apostle who was stoned a few times, almost to death, whipped to almost an inch of his life a few times, driven out of cities, hated by friends and family, left for dead, shipwrecked a night and a day in the ocean, said this, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. The glory that God is trying to produce is so much bigger that when you see it, you're going to say, oh, the suffering that it cost to get that, it's almost embarrassing how little it cost. I can't believe I got all this for so little. And I know that some of the suffering that you face is enormous. What I'm telling you is that the glory is so much bigger. I don't like affliction. I continue to struggle with why God allows it. But I believe what the Bible says about it. I believe that God is steering me towards eternal life. I believe that he is trying to develop something more valuable in me than just not suffering. I believe that it's going to be completely wiped out by the glory that's waiting on the other side. But it still hurts. That's the intellectual answer to why does God allow suffering. Because God is trying to do something better. Something of eternal value, eternal life, faith, and eternal glory. That's the answer. But it can still not feel like a great trade sometimes. So Jesus gave us an example. Something that doesn't speak as much to our minds, but speaks more to our hearts, and I love it. And you know what it is? It's motherhood. It's motherhood. When Jesus was trying to speak to his disciples about the problem of evil, about God, why, if you're good and powerful, do you allow so much hurt? God said, let me tell you about motherhood. And we see it in Hannah's story. We see it in the story of every mother ever. Motherhood is just this uniquely powerful illustration of what God's doing. It's in your outline in the Gospel of John, chapter 16. Jesus put it like this. He said to his disciples that a woman, when she's in travail, in other words, in, in giving birth, when she's in the midst of giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she's delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish. She forgets all about it. This is a real thing. Mothers? <laughs> I just, when, when Evangeline, our, when, when she was born, so our first, I was briefly sure Heather was going to die. She, it was a fairly traumatic birth. <clears throat> Heather was like, we're going to do it the natural way, like no drugs. And I, the supportive husband, said, could I have the drugs? telling you that pregnancy and, and all you women, you, you love to hear a man complain about how hard pregnancy is, I, I'm sure, but <laughs> I had a front row seat to it. We did the husband coach childbirth and I went to the classes and I'm like, well, we're going to, you know, learn the thing and where to push and the things I'm supposed to say. And we went in some hippie lady's house and sat on the floor and learned how to do this. And, <laughs> and, uh, I just remember watching my wife, just all these changes that happened to her body. Poor Heather, she puked all 10 months of that pregnancy. She did not get a trimester off. She would just get in the car and she'd start driving and just that start of motion. She'd just open the car door and puke and shut the door and just keep driving. <laughs> and, and, and all the swelling and the pain and the discomfort and she couldn't sleep. And we bought fancy pillows that, you know, I, I don't know. I was just like, if you didn't know what was happening, you'd think she's for sure dying. 
And then the actual birth itself lasted about eight and a half weeks, I think. And it's just like, I mean, the whole thing is so overwhelming and, and terrifying. And then she had Evangeline. And Heather was immediately ready to have more kids. I remember when we started talking about having more kids, and I said, I don't think you remember how the last one went. <laughs> and you know what? She kind of doesn't. Jesus said that she remembereth no more the anguish for the joy. Amen. And it's not that she doesn't remember. Of course she remembers. What's happened is her remembering is broken. Yeah. The joy was so big that she doesn't remember it right. And Jesus said, ye now therefore have sorrow, but I'll see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. What's, what's Jesus saying? He's saying, I know this hurts. I know it's filled with sorrow and pain and grief and fear. But when it's over, the joy will be so big, you're not going to remember it right. Now, I mean, that's what I just tried to say with a bunch of other examples and Bible verses. But this one, the other one explains intellectually to me why would God allow evil. This one helps my heart. I'm glad my mom didn't quit in the middle of the birthing process before I was born. I'm glad Heather didn't quit before Evangeline was born or before Hugo was born. Don't quit because it hurts. Don't quit because it's sad or scary. Jesus is coming. And all of this is to steer us towards him. And when he gets here, the joy is going to be so big, it's going to swamp the hurt. All right. I want to get back to Hannah here a little bit. I hope that's... The Lord really... I, I know I spent most of my sermon time on it, but as I was putting it together, I just felt like the Lord was saying that there was some people that needed that this morning. And if that's you, I hope that that helps. Okay. Ah. <laughs> Let's look at the rest of Hannah's story here. In verses 6 through 8, we find the reality of cruelty and of misunderstanding. So she's, the Lord has shut up her womb. She's dealing with this problem of evil, of why God would allow suffering and hurt. In verse 6, her adversary, that's Elkanah's other wife, Paniah, her adversary provoked her sore to make her fret. You ever had someone that's not only provoking you, but they're doing it to make you sad? Sometimes people provoke you just because they're obnoxious. But sometimes they'll get you because they want to watch you boil. And that's what Panaya is doing. She's antagonizing her on purpose to try to make her overwhelmed because the Lord had shut up her womb. Panaya has found the thing that Hannah is the most grieved about, the saddest about, and the most broken about, and she's picking on that. And add it and add it and add it until she can make her blow her top. Verse 7, as he, as he did so year by year when she went to the house of the Lord, she provoked her. Therefore she wept and couldn't eat. And then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? Why eatest thou not? Why is thy heart grieved? Wait for that. 
Am I not better to thee than ten sons? <laughs> Before I was married, I, that went right over my head. And, and now I can barely even read it out loud without going, ooh. Elkanah is a foolish husband. <laughs> this is such a stupid thing to say. I know you're sorry you can't have kids, honey, but you got me. I'm better than 10 sons, huh? <laughs> I mean, that's brutal. This guy, the men in this story come off very poorly. <laughs> we do in many Bible stories. This one's rough. So here's poor Hannah. She's got Paniah antagonizing her cruelly on purpose. And she's got a clueless dip for a husband. <laughs> and we all go through those things where you have people that are coming after you with cruelty or making it worse just through stupid misunderstanding. Psalms 142, David experiences. He said, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. This is common to the human experience. But I want you to know that Hannah, in verse 9 and 10, Hannah knew where to go for help. Verse 9, Hannah rose up after they'd eaten in Silo and after they'd drunk, and Eli the priest sat on a seat by a post of the temple. Verse 10, and she was in bitterness of soul, and she prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Don't overlook this. Hannah knew where to go for help. Too often, people don't know where to go to help. We forget where our help comes from. But Hannah knew She's got an awful woman antagonizing her. She's got a clueless husband, but she knows where to go to get help. And she goes and prays to the Lord. In fact, it's just, David knew it too. That same verse where he said, I looked on my right hand and no one would know me. The very next verse, verse five, David says, I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry. I'm brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors for they're stronger than I. Know where to go to get help. Run to the Lord. In verse 11, we see then the connection in Hannah's story between love and sacrifice. Our modern culture is so deeply selfish. It's one of the great griefs of modern American and really modern Western culture is the incredibly deep selfishness. Our idea, our modern concept of love what, what, what people broadly in America mean when they say love is a horrifying, deeply selfish thing that they mean. We talk about this whenever I do marriage counseling or when we're talking to somebody that's going to get married or whatever. It's like, forget what you learn from Disney and the culture about what love is. It's wrong. True love is intimately connected with sacrifice. You see what somebody's willing to give and you know what they love. In verse 11, Hannah understood this. She vowed a vow. She said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid and remember me, forget not thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. She's trying to make a deal with God. She says, God, if I can have a kid, I'll give him back to you. It's a Nazarite vow. It's beyond the scope of the message this morning, but suffice to say that she's saying, Lord, if you give me a kid, I'll give him back to you. But love and sacrifice are connected. And I'll tell you this, God's love for you is connected to sacrifice. John 3, 16 is the most famous verse in the Bible. And for good reason, it should be. It says this, that God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God didn't just love you in a sentimental, emotional, or selfish way. God loved you enough to sacrifice the most valuable thing. So that you could benefit. Hannah knows not only where to get help, but she knows that it's okay to pour your grief out to the God who understands. I preached on this 
preach on this regularly. I preached on it last week. And I would remind you, if I could, that God knows everything every way. He already knows. When you go talk to him, that's the time to go ahead and let it all out. Verse 12 came to pass that as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. So she's at the temple. She's not looking for attention. She's not making a big scene. She's not throwing herself around. She's there at the temple just in her heart praying, but she's, she's so fervently and so stricken with grief that as she's praying that her, I don't know if that happens to you, but sometimes if you're really thinking that your mouth will kind of just, now my mouth is always moving, so I don't, you know, but. <laughs> but she's just in deep grief here. And now here's another man to come along and make things better. <laughs> Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunk. So he walks up to her, verse 14, said, how long will thou be drunken? Put away wine from thee. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor. I mean, here's this poor woman just pouring her heart out to God. And Eli, the priest, walks up and says, Quit being drunk. Why are you drunk here at church? I mean, at the temple. That's brutal. But Hannah answered in verse 15. She said, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine or strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy hand made for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, have I spoken to their two? I want you to see here that Hannah's poured out her soul. Even though it's an abundance of complaint and grief, she's talking to the right person about it. She knows that her husband doesn't understand. She's not trying to get the priest to fix her problems. She's pouring it out to the Lord. And by the way, when you do that, you have a God who understands. Hebrews 4 says, we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. When you talk to Jesus, he's touched. It means he's, he's emotionally affected by your infirmities. The things that hurt you affect the heart of God. Jesus cares. When you hurt, he cares. And you can talk to him the way you would talk to somebody who understands. Special needs parents like us, we have a secret handshake that only other special needs parents gets to know. And there, it's nice to talk to other special needs parents sometimes because they understand in a different way what we're going through than the parents of the neurotypicals do. And, and I love neurotypical kids and parents of neurotypicals. I don't know if that, you know that's what we call you behind your back, but, <laughs> but when, you, when you're in that boat, you have somebody that's going through the same thing you're going through, whatever that is, whether it was you know, your military service or some traumatic thing you've been through, when you have somebody that's done that same thing, that's nice to be able to talk to somebody who understands it in a different way. But even there, sometimes there's some things that even Heather and I cannot talk to each other very well about because as much as Heather understands what I'm going through, she understands it better than any other living person, but she does not know what it's like to be Evangeline's dad. There's only one person I can talk to who totally understands and his name is Jesus. And I'm telling you, it is a relief to be able to talk to somebody that understands. Hannah understood it. Go talk to somebody that understands. Go talk to God. You're invited to come. Verses 17 to 18, we see the hope and faith, which is to say, waiting on the Lord. In verse 17, Eli gets his act together a little bit. Eli answered and he said, go in peace. The God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, let thy handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and she did eat and her countenance was no more sad. She's not pregnant, but she goes away happy. Why? Because she believes that God is going to answer her prayer. She takes Eli, even after he's been kind of a dirtbag, <laughs> 
let's just say a compassion, major compassion failure. She recognizes him as the high priest. And when he says, God grant thee thy petition, she, she says, God's going to answer my prayer. And she goes away, even though it's not answered yet, expecting that God will. And just the expectation of God acting is enough to lift her back up. Biblical hope is not wishful thinking. Hope, and, and, and in the Bible, I preached a whole message on this a number of years ago. It, it's chava, and it means to wait for, to expect. Biblical hope is not, I hope God does something. Biblical hope is waiting for God to do the thing he has said he'll do. That's hope. Sometimes we get jaded on hope. I, I got very jaded on hope for a lot of years because I was like, hoping things would get better or hoping this would happen and it never came to pass. And I started to think hope is a game for suckers. You just hope, you get your hopes up and they get dashed and you get bitter and jaded. That's what I was doing. Until I realized that biblical hope is not the things I hope will happen. Biblical hope is waiting for Jesus to show up. And Jesus always shows up. Psalms 130 is my favorite verse for understanding what the biblical hope is. Psalms 130 is there in your outline. It says, I wait for the Lord. That word wait there is kava. It, it's hope. It says, you could render this either way you wanted. I wait for the Lord. Or you could say, I hope for the Lord. It's the same thing. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. In his word do I hope. Same thing. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. You don't really hope for the sun to come up. I took this picture while I was driving Evangeline around very early one morning when she has trouble sleeping, a lot of seizures. You know, we do lots of driving with her and, and it was just like, it was, I could tell it was going to be a beautiful sunrise and I took this picture and I was like, I was waiting for the sun to come up. I was hoping for the sun to come up, biblically. I'm wondering... I wonder if the sun's going to come up today. I wasn't sure when it was going to come up. But I knew it would. I could see the early signs of it. About 10 minutes later, I took this picture. Still no sun. But it's coming. The Bible says that those that hope in the Lord... We can wait more than those that watch for morning. The fact that God is going to show up is more certain than that the sun will come up. That's in the Bible. Wait on the Lord. You can wait for God to show up. And Hannah does. She goes away happy, even though God hasn't done anything yet. She goes away happy because she says, I know the sun's going to come up. And of course, finally, faith in the Lord is always rewarded. Not faith for the thing you want God to do. Not faith for the thing you wish will happen. Faith in the Lord is always rewarded. Verse 19 and 20, the end of Hannah's story here. It says, they rose up early in the morning and they worshiped before the Lord and they returned and came to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel. Two whole books of the Bible named for this kid. <laughs> she says, because I've asked him of the Lord. If you jump ahead in 1 Samuel chapter 2, it's in your outline 21. I just want you to see this too, that the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and she bare three sons and two daughters. She asked God, give me a son and I'll give him to you. And God gave her three sons and two daughters. Faith in the Lord is always rewarded. So here's the wisdom from mom. This is the end of the message. This is the application here now. Wisdom from mom. I'd like to suggest to you three bits of wisdom. Number one is this. God redeems suffering into joy. If we could take a lesson from mom this morning, it's this. God turns suffering into into joy. Just like moms turn travail into precious new babies. Yeah. Secondly, true love sacrifices for the beloved. 
If there's a lesson here from Hannah, this would be very near the top of the list. That true love sacrifices for the thing loved. And I'm grateful for all the people that have sacrificially loved me, for the sacrificial way in which my mother has loved me, the sacrificial way that Heather loves my kids, our kids. And I'm especially grateful for the love of God, that he sacrifices for his beloved. And that's you and me. And finally, hope which I'll remind you again, is waiting on the Lord. Hope is waiting for Jesus to show up. If you're in a season in your life where you're waiting for Jesus to show up, it's always worth it to wait. Don't quit in the travail. Don't quit during the birth pangs. It's worth it to wait. Jesus said, a woman when she's in travail has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she's delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for the joy. For the joy that a man is born into the world. Ye now therefore have sorrow. Some of you need to hear this this morning. And sister, if you're able to come and just play. Some of you need to hear this this morning. Here it is from Jesus, not your pastor. Jesus said, ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. Amen. Jesus is coming. Amen. They waited for him to come the first time and he did. And we're waiting for him to come the second time and he will. And when he gets here, you're going to be glad you waited for him. It's always worth it. And whatever that sorrow is that you're going through, and it's different for every person in this room, and I know some of them, and they hurt, and for what it's worth, I'm hurting with you. And you can talk to Jesus. You can pour it all out to him. He understands. He wants to hear from you. You talk to him. But Jesus said, I know you have sorrow. But intellectual reasons and theological explanations aside, when I see you again, the joy is going to be so big. It's going to be like motherhood. It's going to alter your memory of how it all went because it's going to be so great. So happy Mother's Day. <laughs> it's the most powerful thing I know of to encourage me through the hard seasons of life. And I hope it'll encourage you. I'm just going to give you a time of quietness here. Less of a typical invitation. Listen, if you need to get saved or know that heaven's your home, come talk to us. And, but I just, it's such a big topic. And I don't even really know what to say, but everybody here has got some business they need to do with God. And so we're just going to let the piano play. I'll just let you talk to God about whatever it is you need to talk to him about. And then we'll sing and go home or we'll have lunch or whatever. But right now, before that happens, you take a minute. Talk to the God who understands. <laughs>